Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We are continuing our HFES 2018 coverage. My name is Nick Rome. I'm here with Blake Arnsdorf, and we're also joined by Dr. Valerie Rice, who is the outgoing president of HFES. Valerie, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. How are you? How, how is your conference holding up so far? <laughs> it's holding up very, very well. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and the vast majority of work that I have to do is over. Good. <laughs> so, so you are the outgoing president of HFES, but before we get there, I want to kind of catch our listeners up, and for those of our listeners who might not know who you are, can you just kind of give us a little bit of background about where you've been, what kind of research you've been doing? Absolutely. So I started out not in human factors and ergonomics. I started out as an occupational therapist. And uh, in occupational therapy, you have to do internships, at least six months of internships. I borrowed my way through college, um, even for my master's degree, which is in OT. And um, I didn't know how I was going to do these internships because you can't get uh, school funding, you know, that last part, at least not in the school I went to. So you, in the school I went to, you could only do those internships after you finished the master's degree. So I couldn't do school loans, for example. Okay. So um, I found out about a program run by the U.S. Army where you could apply for it and you could do the, your internships in the Army. Actually, you got to do nine months instead of six. And then you owed them time. So you would basically be active duty for three years. So I did that, thinking all the time that it was just three years, right? And, and, <laughs> and the Army gives you um, way more responsibility, way quicker um, in a lot of fields. And so I thought, well, gosh, after three years with the Army, I can get out and run a clinic. Not a big deal. But at the end of those three years, they said, well, why don't you stay active duty? And I said, why? What will you do for me? And they said, well, we'll bring you back to Walter Reed because the internships at Walter Reed but then I had gone to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I said, what? I've already been there. Why, why would I want to do that? And they <laughs> said, well, you know what? You can apply for a second master's degree in healthcare administration with the U.S. Army Baylor program. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll apply for that. You'll send me back to school. And then what? And they said, then you owe another couple of years. And, you know, and I thought, well, all right. So I did that. In that program, you have to do one year of internship. But I got to do my one year of internship in Germany. So I was stationed in Germany for a year, you know, doing the internship, and you rotate through every single department in the hospital. And I did a lot of projects that were very much human factors related. And then I spent the other two years of payback running a clinic in um, Frankfurt, Germany. Oh, wow. Then I was at the end of my time, payback time, and they said, well, why don't you stay? You've been in for a while. And I said, well, what could I do? And they said, well, you could apply to get a Ph.D. And I thought, <laughs> you know what? I could. And I talked to the powers that be in, in the our core, and um, you could get a Ph.D. in OT. And I said, you know, OTs, occupational therapists, get people back to what they call work or, you know, <laughs> sure. be o occupied in whatever it is that they do. I mean, it could be their, their workplace. It could be being a father. It could be you know, whatever even they do for their leisure. And I said, you really ought to send people back to get PhDs in the study of work, which is ergonomics. And um, they approved it. So I went back and got my uh, PhD in uh, human factors and ergonomics. And by that time, I mean, if you're, you're adding up this time, we're, I've been active duty for, what, 16 years or so by then? And so I finished that payback time. And they had already put me in a place where I was doing full-time research. Then they put me somewhere where I got to do um, run another um, OT program for a tri-service program and then the commanding general there uh, talked to me because 
about that time, I wrote a book on uh, ergonomics for healthcare. I think it was the first one that was ever out, very much pointed towards rehabilitation. But I gave him a copy of it, and his wife was an um, occupational health nurse, I think, and she loved it. Oh. And so he called me in and started asking me questions about how people were injured in the Army and what did I think. And he let me do a three-year research project um, discovering how our soldiers were being injured um, on that post. So... By the time I finished that, I was at a 25-year career. <laughs> That's an incredible just, career path. Just three years. <laughs> <laughs> it was just Turned three years. 25, 25 years. yeah. Just goes to show, like, you never know where your career path is going to take you until you're actually in, right? Absolutely. And then you were talking about, the other day, your, your most recent sort of uh, research vein of mindfulness, right? Yes. So, um, if you don't mind... I kind of want to also go over the early research oh, sure. in yeah, the uh, military, just because it's been very different. Yeah. So um, when I was first um, doing research, I did all the lifting, pushing, pulling, carrying, um, very much physical demands, heavy physical demands of our soldiers. Um, after that, I ended up doing research on education and professionalism, I don't know if you remember, you know, 10 years or 12 years ago, um, it was quite a crisis in professionalism in a lot of professions. Mm. And so looking at education, not just for the education piece, but ethics, how to behave like a professional, how to interact with the people that are your professional colleagues. So I did some work in that area. And then I did all, all the musculoskeletal things. Mm -hmm. um, and musculoskeletal injuries and prevention. And then um, about six or seven years ago, I was at, this is now I'm out of the service, and I'm, I've gone back to work for the Army as a civilian, right? right? Okay. Right. So they asked me to um, compare teaching and learning over a virtual world with in-person teaching and learning. And at that time, I thought, well... I was, you know, at Fort Sam Houston, which is the largest medical um, teaching facility in the world. And I thought, well, I don't want to just do anatomy and physiology. I want to do something that the Army needs. And we had a lot of people coming back with uh, PTSD or other um, psychosocial disorders after being uh, deployed in harm's way. So I chose mindfulness meditation as my test case. Hmm. So when I finished the research, some people were interested in the um, comparison of in-person with um, virtual world teaching and learning, but way more people were interested in mindfulness and what huh. we found with the mindfulness. So since then, we've done a number of projects. Um, that one was looking at traditional mindfulness training, um, mindfulness-based stress reduction training. Now we've looked at uh, five-day mindfulness-based stress reduction training. This year we're going to be looking at uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction training or mindfulness training using neuromodulators. In addition, uh, we're going to embed it in um, the hospital there at Fort Sam Houston. They've asked us to make it part of the nurse's normal functioning. And then we'll be looking at nursing errors and patient falls. Okay. Um, yeah, so, and we've also gone out to various posts. We've gone out um, and trained young soldiers before they went on a, uh, into the desert um, <laughs> in Texas <laughs> right, right. for a field training exercise to see if they actually used it, um, what they thought of it, um, and somewhat to militarize it because um, you want to speak the same language. I think sure. that happens normally anyway in, in teaching a class like mindfulness, but um, to really see what they want. Just for the, for the listeners, like, say, would you mind just defining a little bit of what mindfulness actually is? Because it's a lot out in the media now, and there is, a, like, like you said in your panel the other day or in your talk the other day, there is some, like, woo-woo aspects to it um, that you did a good job kind of delineating really how it can be useful to a, a large amount of people. Yeah, I think that that's um, a really important point, and thanks for asking it because a lot of people are saying that they teach mindfulness or they'll say in their speech, I, I heard um, on the plane, you know, one of the stewardesses that was uh, 
talking to everyone in the plane and said, be mindful about your luggage. And I thought, <laughs> what she really means is be aware, it, but not sure. truly what I would consider being mindful. So John Kabat-Zinn that came, came back, and he's one of the individuals that really popularized mindfulness in this country. And he describes it as being present, uh, fully present, on purpose, in a special way, without judgment. And that's mm. it's a mouthful. But it's not sitting on a cushion. It's not doing the mindfulness exercise per se. That's all part of the training. But it can really become kind of a way of life in that you're aware of where you are, um, the people that you're with, um, and you're also aware of your own internal sensations, thoughts, and feelings. I oftentimes liken it to, um, you, know how, you know what situation awareness is? Oh, yeah. Well, oh. when situation awareness is all about the outside, mindfulness is very much about the inside because our bodies and our thoughts and our emotions give us information that we can use in relationship. So relationship to other people, relationship to your job, relationship to the very task that you're, you're doing. So like I said, it becomes kind of part of you and how you, right. how you interact with anything. Yeah, I, just a quick little kind of nerdy point from my perspective. So um, I forget who it was. I think it was Jim Blaskovich. He was giving a talk uh, that said, you know, during this presentation, your mind will fleet this many times or like seven times a second, I'll make you a compromise of if you only do it three times, I'll only do it once or something like that. And it, he used that as kind of a form of virtual reality, but that's just kind of a nerdy note that I wanted to touch on. Um, so I, I kind of want to jump into sort of how you got involved with HFES, um, and you're currently the outgoing president of HFES. And one thing we were talking about before the show was something I didn't know is that the president is like a three what, what is it, a three year term uh, correct so we can start there um it's i think it's a very interesting um, way to do the president of an organization it's a three-year term and in the very first year you are the president elect and a lot of people think that that person is just kind of following the president or, around and kind of learning the ropes but it's not true you have uh, assigned duties and things that you need to do as a president-elect. But part of it is to be with that president and see how things are, are working and get involved before it's your turn to be president. So then the second year, you become president. And um, I think most people know that you're what you do there, you know, you're, you're helping the executive council. And, and I believe, I'm not sure everybody believes this, but I believe that the president... Really, it's not about getting in there and, and having your own agenda, but uh, pulling that from the people that are on the council or in, in the organization. But you're president for one year. And then after that year, you become the immediate past president, and you have your own assignments then, some of which um, you only had as president, and then you carry into that past presidency um, to uh, have some continuity for that group. Hmm. Um, so for the Government Relations Committee, for example, I will stay on that uh, committee um, even though I'm past president. And I know Kermit's going to have a lot of other assignments for me too. Yeah, I guess from our perspective, I mean, our correspondence with you have, have all had both you and Kermit on them. And um, I guess, yeah, we just didn't realize that that was the role is that there's there's – much more going on behind the scenes, and it's, it's kind of nice to demystify that for um, potential HFES members who don't know what's going on at the organizational level. Right, and it also, I think, makes being president less scary yeah. um, because you work as a team, and hopefully all three of the presidents work as a team because, um, as um, Paul Green said in a meeting this week, he said, when the three presidents work together, you know, in, as almost a symbiotic team, that's when you really get things done within the society. And if they work separately, where, you know, no, I'm only going to follow you around for a year, now I'm president, now I'm not going to do anything because I'm the past president, well, again, continuity is lost, and the flow, if you're president for one year, it's very difficult to right. accomplish a lot in one single year. 
And so if you're working with each other all the way along, you really can make some changes in in basically the nine years that all of you are on. Sure, it's much more fluid. So that's mm-hmm. a good kind of segue into the next topic that I'd like to discuss is um, what are some challenges the organization is facing and then what have we done kind of in the past year to um, address some of these challenges? Well, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is membership. And membership is declining in associations um, all over the United States. And so it's not only us that are struggling with it, um, a lot of other professional organizations and, and other associations that are not professional associations. And so I think it's important for us to look and see, well, why is that happening? Is it because there's so many splinter organizations that people... Um, instead of starting a new technical group, uh, say like a, a, there is a children's technical group for people who are particularly interested in designing for children, just for example. Right. That group could have decided that they wanted to start their own separate professional organization on designing for children. And so we do see that splintering occur. And so, I mean, that could be part of the reason. It could be potentially the, um, finances and that businesses are cutting back on paying for people to be members or to go to a professional association meeting. I think some of it is um, some of the uh, younger individuals, um, the millennials, um, would like to have their own definition of how they network and um, what that means for them. So we're really, we've been working on it during the year. I've been president, I think Kermit's gonna uh, continue it. And basically, we're going to be looking not only like I was kind of describing it, looking at a lot of other organizations and the patterns across the country, but also within the organization so we can better define what our members want and how to present it to them. Sure. And I guess one kind of example that's close to home is that I forget what the committee was, but you have a committee of um, uh, varying folks, uh, varying degrees of... uh, where you are in your career, right? Like someone could be a student, undergrad, a graduate. What, what is that council? Well, we actually have a, a, a number of committees that deal with, we have a, a committee for working with students. We have a mid-career committee. So we have a, a number of them, but it's uh, primarily all under um, membership. Okay. Well, so so the example I was getting to was that one of the younger members actually recommended us, and so that's you're right. kind of that's why you're here. You're yeah, yeah. why we're here currently. So so what you're um, talking about? We have a we did start a new program this past year, and um, we kind of uh, refer to it as the. Um, early leader development or the um, part of a mentee relationship and what we do is um, we invite three younger careerists a student to maybe a graduate student somebody in their early career and they come to the executive council meeting that's always two days before the annual meeting and two days before the health care symposium so um, we had our very, very first group at the mid-year meeting this year, and you're absolutely right. The undergraduate said to the executive council, my favorite podcast, and then he mentioned your podcast, and then he, he went on to describe some of the podcasts and what you showed and what it had to say about human factors and how you'd gone to various conferences that were related to human factors but might not, might not be the Human Factors Conference, and um, we all kind of looked at each other and went, what? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> does, that, does that exist? <laughs> and so he was pulling it up, and everybody was pulling it up on their computer, and, and it was um, a great thing to um, have those folks um, at that c- meeting, and then we had three more uh, for this meeting. People can apply to it. Um, so the first time that it was the three presidents, we each invited someone. Um, for the second one here at the annual meeting, uh, people could actually um, nominate themselves and uh, apply, and then there was a, a vetting process. That's great. Cool. And, and so that example is just one that's close to home, but I'm sure there have been other examples of kind of reaching out from hearing from these early career professionals, right? Abs- absolutely. And... Um, like you said, we do have a you know a uh, student and an early career uh, committee. So they always come up with some other things that could be done. Um, somebody came up to me after um, one of the sessions yesterday and had a 
a really great idea. Um, we had a session on how the um, human factors group in the UK and here in the United States could work together. And he didn't bring it up during it, but he brought it up afterwards, and I thought it was very clever. He said, you know, um, most universities have uh, a program where you can go and study overseas for a semester, right? Mm. He said, so maybe human factors could work with the universities on identifying places that they could go in the UK. So that's a, you know, totally from the bottom up suggestion, and um, it's something that we can look into, but all the time. Yeah, that could be an incredible opportunity for a lot of people, right? Like, because you mentioning that you got to go to Germany and kind of apply your human factors knowledge, mm -hmm. that had to be like an overwhelmingly rewarding experience, right? It was great. I got to spend time in the German hospitals and the German military hospitals and hospitals in England to kind of take a look at socialized medicine. I mean, so yeah, that was amazing. So uh, yeah, I think it could be a really good idea. Yeah, I feel like working at an international level is a, a great thing for human factors and ergonomics practitioners across the board. Yeah. And the, the program I just mentioned, we also kind of call it the, the Emerging Leader Program, where we're identifying uh, younger individuals that we really think are going to become leaders. But we don't always know all of them, so I'm really hoping that people, like I said, will self-identify and, and say, you know, I'm interested in being a leader right. and here in this organization. Um, because we don't always see them. Right. So I know we're running a little tight on time, but um, I just want to, before we go, if people want to find out more information about HFES or what the organization's all about, where can they go? You can go to hfes.org and um, take a look at the website and check it out. I would say that um, you can also, uh, and I did this a lot, if I was studying something that I really liked, I would find the people that were, the most prolific in writing on it, and I would just call them. And call them up. I would, I would just call <laughs> them up. If they didn't want to speak to me, what, if, what did I lose? A phone call. And if they did speak to me, I got to speak to one of the people that I admired that was publishing in the area that I was interested in. So uh, most of the folks in human factors and ergonomics, I think, are pretty open to that. Um, we like to help other folks, and we really love it when somebody loves what we love. So... <laughs> That's excellent advice. Well, yeah, that's perfect. And Dr. Valerie Rice, thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciate it. And honestly, we can tell that there's been this sort of initiative that has kind of shifted. So speaking from the bottom, we can we can tell. So thank you so much for, for coming on the show and talking with us. We'd like to close out the show by saying it depends because in human factors, everything kind of depends on the human, right? So I'll count us down. We'll say it depends, and then we'll be out of here. Ready? Three, two, one. It, it depends. depends.